Hello, how's everybody doing today? All right, killer. Thanks to Product School for having me come to speak today. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. Um, just a little bit more about me. Uh, I like collages. Uh, these are uh, some of the places I've worked at and some of the uh, products I've built. Um, I work at Pfizer right now, um, creating uh, digital solutions for their manufacturing operations. Uh, prior to that, I was at Very, which I know is not all the marketing material for this talk. Uh, I was a senior product manager there. And before that, I was at uh, Verifone Taxi. I worked for four years in the taxi technology space, uh, trying to modernize the technology space um, and kind of play in the ride sharing uh, uh, place a little bit. Uh, prior to that, I was in Los Angeles, which I miss dearly, which is why I have that purple picture up there. Uh, I made video games out there. And uh, prior to that, I got my start at Bloomberg here in New York, uh, writing code and uh, you know, leading development projects. So uh, very excited to talk to you guys today. Um, first, I want to start with uh, an obvious question is why do we hire, why should any company hire you, right? Um, and I think this gets lost a lot in you know, today's uh, product management discussions. Uh, there are companies who don't hire product managers. They just get by fine without them, right? So when you go into a job, your first job as a product manager, it's really important to keep in mind why you're there. Right? Why that company has decided to invest in this, in this function. Right? There's always finance, there's usually operations, maybe sales if you're doing that kind of business. But why product? Right? Why is this a separate function distinct from the others? It's a really important question. And years ago there wasn't there. It wasn't in technology for the most part. There was some other function was doing it in some way. So always keep in mind what value you're bringing to the table right? and where sort of product fits into the organization, which I'll, I'll touch on more in, in, a, in a couple minutes. Um, this is what you're not. Okay? If you're at a startup or you're at a company who doesn't really understand modern product management and software, you'll be asked to do all these jobs over here. Don't do them, okay? They, they are somebody else's job. I know there's an adage, oh, don't, don't say it's not my job, but you, you, don't wanna, you won't make a name for yourself in product or, and you won't be doing product management if you sign up for the jobs on the left, okay? Marty Kagan is a, is a great thought leader in, in product management. He wrote a book called Inspired and he has a, a second edition out. And you know, this is a quote from him talking about good product teams versus bad product teams. And the essence of it is, uh, if all you're doing is just you know, taking the requirements from sales and you know, going to the engineers and building it, you're not really doing modern product management. You're, you're playing telephone, right? So don't be a backlog administrator and just shuffle things in a backlog and don't be a short order cook and just build, you know, make whatever people ask you to make. Um, similarly, you're not there to just uh, you know, ship things and you know, just execute orders from somebody else or, or worry about just execution, right? And that's the delivery or scrum master or project manager role, right? The reason, one of the reasons product came about as a separate function in software is because project management is typically concerned with time, cost, and scope, right? None of those things have to do with value, right? Which is generally one of the things associated with product management, which I'll unpack in a little bit. Um, similarly, you're not the engineering manager. The engineers or, or the, the, the people making the product don't report to you, right? Which is obvious, but you also aren't responsible for their direct performance or their sort of growth and their productivity. That, that's not your role. So be mindful of what you're being asked to do. And if you need to escalate and, and get help from other people, please do that. Um, now, I understand that some startups or, or some places that you know, maybe don't have the resources, you may be asked to do some of these tasks. And some of these tasks, some parts of some of these jobs are important to product management, but don't make this your, your life's work if you want to do product. So we're going to talk about how to know your customers best for sure, but I wanted to start with some of these more framing questions, right? So when you get into your first job as a product manager, how do you succeed, right? What does success look like? What are the most important questions that you need to answer as a product manager? Um, I would say you have to start with where do you take the product? This is, this is the million dollar question. This is what everybody wants to know. Where do we go? Where do we go from here, right? Not just what do you build today, but what are you going to build tomorrow? And how are what you're building tomorrow going to help you build something two years from now? It's a strategy question as well as a tactical question, right? Um, and so you, this is exactly why you can't be thinking about, or you can't be exclusively thinking about just executing a, a bunch of orders. You, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of inputs to make this decision. Um, and I'll get into kind of exactly what that is. But this, this is the big question, right? This is what everybody expects you to do, and this is what you will be asked to do as a product manager. What do we build, right? And why? Why do we build this? How does that help us win a market? Um, and I'll get into the, a couple of these questions next. Um, first, how does the product serve customers, right? How are you actually helping customers, right? This isn't a hobby. This is a business, and business needs customers. So how is what you're building and how is what you're 
product doing helping customers? Now, it could be a service. Um, it could be, uh, you know, a, 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 a different kinds of products and, you know, B2B and B2C and all that. But how are you really helping customers? How are you serving them? What are you doing for them? You are the customer advocate. Never forget that, right? No one else's job that I listed up there before is the customer advocate, right? You are the customer advocate. Um, another question, how do you win the market? Again, this isn't, this isn't a, 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 a non-profit, generally. Uh, sometimes you might be at a non-profit, but most of the time you're going to be working at a, at a business that's trying to make money. So how do you win the market, right? How do you differentiate? How do you really conquer a market while at the same time serving customers? That's, that's the triangulation. So th this data here is showing how Amazon has, has taken the smart speaker market with Alexa and won that market in the United States, right? They've lost a little market share since last year. So what? They're still really dominant in the United States. Now, outside the United States, that's a different story, but they found a way to, to win that market in a very short amount of time, and that puts them in a position to do a lot of other interesting things down the road. So these are some of the fundamental questions I, I encourage you to think about when you get into your first role, and you may, you're not going to know the answer. <laughs> so, so don't think you, you, you're expected to, and don't think you'll know it in the first week or the first month, but over time, um, this, is, this is your mission. And I'm going to unpack these in, in kind of a... a, a a little framework here. There's, there's just three, three actions I need you to take when you, when you start your job as a product manager. Because everything you're learning now and everything you're going through in, in product school, hopefully you get that job and you, you, and you get in that, in that role at that company. You need to do, in my opinion, three things. And you know, this is, this is directional advice, right, uh, based on hard-won uh, uh, experiences of mine. Um, and I, you know, I, I give it generously and, and uh, passionately, but of course, you know, uh, take it, take it or leave it. Um, but the three, th the three things I would, I would say, I would frame uh, how to do the job well is going to be listening, learning, and leading. Right? Th those are the things you need to do. Um, and hmm, uh, as I mentioned a little bit before, you know, knowing your product, knowing your business, knowing your your market. You know, that's the first thing. That's the most important thing. This is a business job, right? Product management is a business job, and this is what, where it touches marketing and it touches sales and it touches kind of the business, as a lot of companies will call it. And this is what makes it, again, completely different from the other jobs I had up there that are typically associated with the technology department. Now, you may report into technology, but it's a business job. And this is why MBAs a lot of times are required. This is why um, former CEOs of, or, or founders of companies will take product jobs at bigger companies, because it's fundamentally a business job. Right? You're trying to miss the, move the business forward. That is it, really what's the, the deciding uh, or the, the key thing about it. Um, listening, listening to your customers. Right? That, that's, that, that was kind of the, the original intention of this talk, and, and I brought in a little bit, but knowing your customers and with firsthand information is so important. This is another thing that's very distinct about product management compared to other functions, that you have to go to, go to uh, the customers directly or the users, depending on the model you're in. Um, and and I'll, I'll unpack all these in just a minute. And then the leadership. This is a leadership job, right? So this is another thing that, that's sometimes lost, is that you're not here to um, only collaborate. Yes, it's a collaborative job. It's, it's, it's about you know, bringing people together and leading cross-functional teams and working across departments. But you must lead. You must make hard decisions. You must do that in the face of uncertainty and ambiguity. So good decision-making, judgment, and leadership is really important in product management. So let's, let's uh, dive in to the first one. Um, what do you have to learn, right? Why is learning important? Well, what's your business, right? You have to know what business you're in. You have to know how to make money. You have to know how your business makes money. So this is really important. Are you in a B2B uh, market, right, with big, long sales cycles? Are you in an advertising play like Google or Facebook where that's how you're making money? Uh, are you in a marketplace where, you know, there's kind of two sides and you've got to play both sides? Maybe you're trying to win one side of the market. Um, you have to know how to make money. You have to know how your product relates to that business. Right? Are you selling, is your business selling your product, right? like a SaaS product, software as a service product, or are you making software that is kind of supporting the main business? So at, at, at Very, in my last role, I made uh, custom software for clients from startups all the way to like, mid-sized companies. And the biggest company I worked for was um, an independent wealth management company. And we built them a, uh, a B2B to C platform, effectively. So um, you know, uh, the, the client uh, hired uh, uh, investment advisors, right, who would then work with investment clients, and they needed a platform to facilitate that relationship. So it was software for the wealth management uh, uh, user as well as the investment client, right? So it was a B2B2C product, but they weren't selling that. They weren't monetizing that, right? They, the, uh, the, the client was making money off of the investment advisors, 
right? So that, that has different uh, ramifications when you get all the way down to what do we build compared to we're selling, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a SaaS subscription for a hundred dollars a year, right? And there's no there's no free version. You just buy it or not, right? There are very different factors at play there. Um, you got to know where you are on the product life cycle. Um, is this familiar to anyone? You guys have seen this before? Okay, so I'll, I'll go quick on this, but you have to know, are you really early? So I, I worked in, in the taxi technology slash ride sharing space in 2013, right? This was before Uber was a household name. That was, that was very early. It was a go-to-market situation, right? Or, or are you in a growth market situation, right? In 2015, ride sharing was in growth. It was heavy growth. It was, you know, let's, let's get as many customers as we can. Um, or are you in a maturity and stabilization place, which is kind of where ride sharing is at now today? Um, and, then, and then, of course, there's decline when it's time to upgrade the product or replace it or go on to something new. So you have to know where your product is. You have to know, also have to know where the market is, which I was, I was kind of touching on. But where your product is in relation to the market is important and to itself. So what's the value proposition? Why do people buy your product? Right? This is where you touch a lot into marketing and consumer marketing if you're making a consumer product. Right? So why do customers care at all about what you're doing? Right? What, what, what gets their attention? Um, why do people buy from you? Why, 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 do they, you know, why don't they go do something else? What is the unique selling point or unique selling proposition? Right? At the end of the day, why are, why are you different than somebody else? What's your edge? What's your differentiation? Um, and you know, what, what are the alternatives that the customer has? How are they solving the problem today? Um, there's, some, there's some great resources out there that kind of help solve this, uh, help, help you work through these questions. One really nice template is Jeffrey Moore's template. He wrote uh, Crossing the Chasm, and this is a really simple template for, uh, especially if you're launching a new business, starting a new product, or you're um, um, creating a big new feature that's maybe a multi-year investment that's almost like a mini, that could be a mini product someday. It's a big investment of capital. You gotta really think about these kinds of questions because it's a, it's a big investment. It's gonna be a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, in, in particular at startups, right? If you're trying to like, you know, innovate and you're trying to differentiate yourself, this is, this is a really helpful tool. Um, so I'm gonna tell some stories from ride sharing, which I already kind of sneak peeked a little bit here. So I worked for four years in ride sharing on the taxi technology side. Um, so I worked at uh, Curb, uh, which is in New York now. Um, and I worked at Carhu, which was a, a ill-fated startup uh, trying to kind of do the same thing as Curb, which is to aggregate local taxi suppliers into one um, ride-sharing experience like Uber and Lyft. Um, and then I worked at Verifone Taxi on the driver side, making um, the next generation driver apps that are going to be in half the taxis in New York City. So there's going to be Android tablets in the front seat replacing those old taxi meters. So here are some stories that kind of relate to the stuff I just talked about. So, this is like ancient history now, 10 years ago, but back in the day, before mobile phones were ordering cars, you were, you were calling the cabs on the phone, right? And that was not a great experience, because you didn't know if the cab would show up. And you were crossing your fingers, because you had to catch a flight or catch a train. And it was, it was very stressful. It was very, very tough. And uh, this is so forgotten now um, in, in a lot of major metropolitan cities and states, but in a lot of parts of the states, this is still what they do, because there's no supply on the road, right? So. This, though, was the problem to solve. This was the right job to be done or, you know, sort of main value proposition. I need a ride right now, right? And, and, they, and the ride train companies did a really nice job of solving that. Um, a specific feature that is now sort of, you know, must have, basically, if you were going to start one of these companies today, is being able to track your cab on its way. You know, this was the point of most anxiety when you were making a phone call for a cab company. It's like, is the cab going to come? Um, I used to, you know, have to go to the airport and I would call three cab companies and, you know, see which one showed up because I, I couldn't rely on one of them being late. You know, I, I had to catch a flight. So, you know, knowing what's the value proposition, what is the job to be done is a really, really important thing. Another way of saying it is why is the customer hiring you? What task are they trying to accomplish? You know, B2B, B2C, whatever. Um, so I mentioned I worked at Curb and in the taxi technology space, and this is where it's good to know what, what's the industry that you're working in, where, who are the players on the field. So Curb's strategy was a supply side strategy rather than a demand side strategy, right? So they were gonna um, capture all the supply in a given market, right, all the taxi fleets, and that way you could provide the best level of service to the driver, uh, sorry, to the rider, right? So you capture all the fleets and all the drivers. You don't have to work with individual drivers. You get all 500, all 1,000 drivers in one fell swoop by partnering with the fleet, and then you can then right, get uh, the ride to the, uh, get the car to the, to the passenger as quickly as possible. And good, good idea, but the technology strategy behind that um, was, was where things kind of were tough. 
So there were these companies called dispatch system companies. And this was the legacy technology that Curb and Car and others were trying to displace, um, that ultimately Uber and Lyft did displace. And so what these dispatch companies were doing were getting rides to the actual drivers and letting the fleets manage their fleet of cars and all the billing and all the back end stuff. So these companies, they still exist today. They've gone through disruption as well and some mergers and acquisitions and bankruptcies and all that. But these, these companies ended up, ended up being um, basically frenemies with, with Curb. We had to partner with them because the fleets made us partner with them, but they didn't really want us to win because they had their own consumer apps for one thing. And for another thing, we, we were both kind of doing technology for fleets, right? At the end of the day, this, this aggregator service curb was, uh, it, it, it still, by the way, it still exists today. It, it's not like it, it, it you know, it, it's gone forever. Uh, curb is in New York, it's in LA, it's in Dallas, it's in Chicago, it's in a lot of smaller cities as well. Um, but ultimately this strategy of uh, partnering with, with fleets wasn't as focused on the rider than it was compared to Uber and Lyft, because they're, they're, these things go away in the middle with Uber and Lyft, right? It's just the, the rider, the driver, and, and a TNC, or transportation network company. So let's dive into ride sharing a little bit more in terms of who, you know, in terms of data and market share. So um, back in 2015, Uber was just crushing it. I mean, they're, they're still big, but they were 90% of the market in the States. Lyft has now really eroded into that lead. Right? Um, they're still dominating, but not as much. And it's been a slow, gradual gain. Uber hasn't helped themselves too much um, in the last couple of years, but they are both the dominant players. There are other players, which I'll get into in just a minute, but you know, the, the, the number of, of uh, the, the, the market share is still pretty, pretty dominated by these two companies. Um, one belief in 2015, or 2013, 2014, um, was business travel would never be captured by these companies because that was too risky and companies didn't want to bet on some stranger and all that stuff. Um, and that proved to be false, just as false as you know, people who are kind of scared of, of this whole thing to begin with. Um, so this is, this is the uh, uh, travel reimbursements um, for businesses um, in, in the context of Uber and Lyft. And, you know, two other industries. So not only did taxis get crushed, but so did rental car companies. So that's, that's not as well known that rental cars, about, they lost like half their market share in, in business travel because of, uh, because of Uber and Lyft. So is it, is it over? Is the game over? Um, this right here is share of ride share sales across the country by state compared to the average, right? So the average is 68.5%. And how far is each of these states and major cities from that average, right? So where are the, where are the dollars being spent? basically, by state and by major city. Um, and for the top cities, you know, Uber and Lyft are, are really still dominating those markets. But you can see in some states, there's not that much spending happening, right? It's a big country. And there's a lot of cities, smaller cities and smaller areas that aren't as densely populated where this model that Uber and Lyft have kind of breaks down. You need a lot of demand and you need enough supply to capture enough of that demand in a given area. So you can see the, the, the mountain time zone states and some of the West Coast states, not nearly as many dollars being spent there on ride sharing. Local geography, a lot of local conditions. This is a service ultimately, not just a product. Another thing to note is New York over there, right? Where we're standing. Um, notice the gray, the other, right? So who's, who's capturing those rides? Well, there's some regional players that are starting to claw away some market share via Juno. I don't know if, how many people have used Via or Juno in the room? Yeah, a few people. They are, they are winning some market share in New York City, right? New York City is the number one ground transportation market in, in America, and they have 11% of the market right now of ride sharing, not counting taxis, which is, is its own uh, thing in, in the area. Um, so how do they do that? Right? How does that make sense? Well, it makes sense because Uber and Lyft aren't really very good at short trips. Um, it's too expensive and the drivers don't really want them. They'd rather take the airport rides or the rides out to the boroughs and things like that. And so, you know, Via and Juno, this is one of the reasons, but one of the reasons is they're really good at these short trips because they've come up with interesting pricing strategies and they focus on really small um, uh, areas. Same thing with taxi. Taxi still has a lot of rides in New York, yellow taxis, because they're much better at short trips. So getting, you know, I've, I learned this sort of being in the industry, right, but Th these are the kind of things that when you're entering a new market, getting to know the data, getting to know the players, getting to know what's actually happening really deeply is, is a great way to learn a given industry. 
Finally, where's, what's after ride sharing? What are businesses that are going to be built on top of ride sharing? These are two products that are being built basically on top of ride sharing. Cargo is a vending machine in the backseat of cars to help drivers earn more money and provide a little added value to passengers. Surf, and there's a couple others out there like Surf, are going to, are going to sell advertising dollars and entertainment in the back seat for drivers. So they can have a nice little tablet back there. We're used to seeing that in New York. There's a big screen that blares Jimmy Fallon and all that stuff. But in most other markets, they don't have that, right? So this back seat entertainment and advertising uh, pro basically product uh, can make advertisers uh, happy and it can also make drivers more money. So when you enter a market that's you know, sort of maturing, Right? Look at what's going to come next. Look at what things can be built on top of that fairly new business. Right? This is less than 10 years old, this business. So I'm going to move on to the next part here. But any questions on any of that so far? Yes? Uh, on the first slide where you showed your collage and your experience, okay. you covered a I won't go back to number, that. <laughs> number of companies, yeah. big, small, medium-sized yeah. startups, Bloomberg all the way to Pfizer now. Yeah. And then on the following one of the following slides, you mentioned that the first thing as a product manager you need to focus on is sort of learning the market. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what's the story there? Don't you think you want to uh, stick to a particular uh, market type, mm -hmm. vertical domain? Uh, mm -hmm. and what's your experience been like going through so many not connected industries? Mm -hmm. Great question. Great question. Um, yeah, I, I moved out to LA and I, I moved to Virginia, which is how I started working with Curb when I was in Virginia. That's actually where Curb is, uh, was founded. Um, and so my personal life kind of took me to different, different locations, um, moving out to LA and then Virginia and then to New Jersey. So that, that is part of the reason why I've worked in a lot of different industries, for sure. Um, I went back to ride sharing a couple of times or the taxi tech space because I really liked that industry and I really liked the problems that were, they were solving and again, learning learning in, in depth what factors are at play in that industry. Um, so I, I did stay in that one. And when I was in video games, I was, that, I was there for five years. Um, and that was uh, for especially free to play video games I worked on for, for three years, which is kind of a very specific segment of, uh, of games. Um, so that is a, that, that, that's a, a good thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about career changes and when you're thinking about, um, you know, where do I want to be and what do I want to do? Not just the company, but the, the, the specific group within the company. Right, so one thing I have worked on pretty much my whole career is real-time data streams, which I know is more of a technology solution. But both at Bloomberg and at ride sharing, uh, and in the last couple of years, the work I've done, I've done a lot of work with real-time data and how to use that to either monetize it or make better decisions. And so that's kind of one thread I've had. No matter where I go, I've kind of worked on those kinds of things. So definitely the market's important and 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 the vertical, but there are other ways to have you know expertise in things. Good question. Okay, uh, one more, and then we'll move on. I just have a simple question. Let's say you're solving a new problem or launching a new product. How do you find that and pick up the market? And the yeah. is something that's, you're solving a problem that's going to affect the market. Yeah. And how do you pick, go and identify like, uh, what your users would look like if you have an opinion of the market? Great question. Uh, I'll repeat it. The question is, how do you know if you're creating a company or a startup if, uh, there's enough users for it. Um, that's typically called total addressable market, right? You know, wh what's the size of the market you're going after? And, you know, that's a really important number because that's where you start. And from there, you tend to, like, chip away at, you know, what's the typical user or what's the segment. And um, there's a great free online course by Udacity um, about uh, product design. And, and um, sorry, that's a different course. But the one I'm thinking of is um, how to build a startup, how to launch a startup. And they really do a nice job of unpacking a lot of this stuff. Um, and I think that's... Uh, a great, a great way to go about it. In short, you got to do a lot of testing. You got to do a lot of like uh, uh, prototyping and testing, and you got to do your market research to to get answers to this stuff. And there's companies that specialize in that. They sell market research and market data. So what 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 I don't want to see happen, uh, and, I, and sometimes I see this, is uh, this idea of throwing things over the wall. Right. This is what happened, you know, uh, a long time ago. Uh, it still happens sometimes at some places, but you know, there'd be requirements, and they just get thrown over the wall to, to engineers, right, uh, and development team members. Hey, go build this. Um, and, you know, and and I've seen some product managers kind of walk away. Hey, I'm good. I spent 12 weeks creating this perfect blueprint, this perfect design, these perfect requirements. I'm good. I'll check in at the end of the iteration later, guys. Right. That's 
that, th that's a problem because you, you lose empathy for the people actually making the product. Um, you know, this, is, this, is a, this kind of process here is, um, is, is, uh, a, can be a pretty successful process. It's used by uh, you know, a, a, a digital agency. Um, but the, the trouble with it is you're not making the product all the way at the end still. Right? You're shaping the product early with some of the design thinking stuff and the UX design stuff. But if you do too much of it for too long, it's no better than the 500-page requirement document from you know, the 70s. So don't, don't go that way, particularly when you're short on time and resources. Right? Do these activities, but don't overdo them. Okay? That's the key is striking the right balance. Now, if you're aiming really big and you got one shot and that's the situation you're in, then you may want to spend more time with upfront planning and upfront design. Um, but that's the balance to make. Right. Um, there are companies that have been successful with that approach. Kickstarter, I think, designed their product for like three years. Right. They were also doing a blue ocean strategy, and there weren't any competitors, and so they had that luxury. But that's just another factor to uh, to keep in mind. Um, here's where I'm going to kind of go back a little bit against what I said before. I think good product managers are involved in shipping. They want to see their product shipped. Right. They don't want to just kind of I'm going to set it all up, and, and then and then I'm not really involved. Um, the reason for that is because this is where you have to make the hard calls, right? Resources, time, effort, all these things, you know, this is where it bleeds a little bit into, into, a lot of, uh, into some project management skills, um, especially when it comes to what requirements do we drop or what use cases don't we solve or does this matter to customers or this requirement was vague and, you know, if no one's there to answer questions, what, what's going to happen, right? So when time is short and you want to ship something, um, product managers need to be involved. Um, you've got to have a positive attitude. You've got to be there to help the team win. Um, but you know, th this, is, this is a partnership as well with your project manager or your, your delivery lead. Uh, being able to deal with uncertainty, ambiguity, um, that's, that's a big part of uh, being able to ship something given a set of constraints. Uh, Seth Godin has a great podcast on this called Thrash Now, if you're interested. Um, he talks a lot about how important it is to actually ship something. Because at the end of the day, if you keep putting it off because you're trying to achieve perfection, you may lose. You may lose the market. You may lose your funding. So to, to kind of wrap this all up, um, of all the Venn diagrams on the internet about product management and UX design and all this stuff, I, I, I like this one because I think it really captures you know, what your role is about. It's a business job. It's being obsessed with customers. And it's working, again, for, in the technology space. Right? And understanding enough about technology to make decisions, working with your development team, working with the, the sort of um, people who are building the product to, to shape it and to make sure it's doing what it needs to do. Um, it's hard. I'm not going to say it's easy. It's challenging. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very rewarding experience to, to take a concept, bring it to market, see it succeed, um, and, and, you know, and, and really be a part of that uh, journey. Um, I think if I were to draw this, I would draw business just a little bigger because it is, again, I think a business job first and foremost. You're trying to drive the business forward and help the business win. That's all I got. Thank you.